you must develop an understanding of why the providers order what they order so that you can better prioritize patients and interventions. And when it comes to chest pain, we know that it's a high risk complaint. So we must prioritize these patients and we must understand why the providers again are ordering what they're ordering. What does the workup include? Why are they ordering what they're ordering again? So chest pain has many causes and in the ER, the most deadly causes have to be ruled out first. These can include ACS, which in itself includes STEMIs, and STEMIs, and unstable angina. Then we have pulmonary embolisms, aortic dissection, a pneumothorax, and cardiac tamponade. Then there's uh, emerging conditions like pericarditis or myocarditis. And essentially the list goes on and on and on for the possible causes of chest pain. But in the ER, we have to rule out the deadliest uh, diseases first. So how extensive the workup will be depends on a variety of factors, including patient presentation, their vital signs, their risk factors, such as previous medical history and age. For example, an elderly patient presenting with chest pain that is diaphoretic, the chest pain itself radiates to the arms, the shoulders, the jaw, and exacerbates or gets worse with activity, will likely receive a full workup with serial troponins and EKGs, while on the other hand, someone who is young, presenting with stable vital signs and, and a relatively non-ill appearance, may not go through such an extensive uh, chest pain or cardiac workup. So let's get into the workup itself. The EKG, which is one of the most important things, the EKG should be ideally performed within 15 minutes of the patient arriving, since an EKG can tell whether an MI is present, or at least whether ischemia is occurring, or it can detect an arrhythmia uh, that can be the cause of the chest pain. It should be reviewed by a qualified provider as soon as possible. So why by a qualified provider as soon as possible? Well, simply one of the reasons is as of just a CYA, cover your... But you, as the ear nurse, must also be able to recognize um, what's going on in an EKG because providers can be busy and you must know when to interrupt them, especially if you believe your patient is having an MI, right? You're going to say, hey, stop whatever you're doing. Take a look at this. Let's go focus on that for now because that's a priority uh, for us to do and get handled, right? So another reason for you as an ear nurse to be competent with your with your EKGs and your rhythms is that you could be possibly holding admitted patients, having to take their EKGs and needing to interpret them because many ER docs are not going to get involved with a patient who they are not directly overseeing. So you must be able to recognize and interpret certain rhythms in order to escalate the situation with the patient's overseeing doctor. And then another important reason for you to be really good with EKGs and rhythms is that there may be times when you're in a full arrest or a code, right? And the provider that is overseeing the code may get busy doing something inside the code, and you may be assigned the role of running the ACLS protocols, if recognizing whether what, what rhythm the patient is on on the monitor and deciding what to do. Do you have to defibrillate and so on, right? So you have to be really good with your rhythms and EKGs for that situation because you may be thrown into it and you're going to be the person overseeing the whole uh, code. It doesn't happen too often, but it can happen and it might happen to you someday. So, so uh, make sure that if you do go through an EKG class and you should as a new ER nurse, uh, at whatever program you are, if you are in a program, pay very, very close attention, ask lots of questions and take lots of notes. And then, so let's go with next into the workup is going to be blood work, right? So this includes troponins, a BMP, and a dimer. The troponins are a specific cardiac marker that gets released when the heart muscle itself is damaged, and it usually will rise between two to six hours from the initial myocardial insult or damage to the muscle, right? A BMP will assist in evaluating the patient for heart failure, and then a dimer will help rule out whether a blood clot is present, which is a key lab used for pulmonary embolisms, right? Because again, we're going back to what is causing this chest pain, this cardiac workup. It doesn't, it's not always just a heart attack. It can be a lot of different things like we discussed, you know? So one of them is a pulmonary embolism, and we use the dimer for that. And Another is a BMP, and we use that for uh, heart failure, as we just said. And then next is going to be a chest x-ray, which is great for identifying pneumothorax, identifying pneumonia, cardiomegaly, pulmonary edema, and it's good for a lot of other things, but just for those for now, we'll mention. And then with ultrasound, a provider who is good with the ultrasound can assess also for a pneumothorax, for a pericardial effusion, and they can even evaluate how well the heart is contracting uh, by just doing a simple bedside ultrasound. Then ultimately, a CT of the chest can be obtained, right, if there's still further questions. And these are great because they're very detailed images of blood vessels, of organs, bones, and soft tissue, which by getting a CT, you're going to be ruling out or ruling in a lot of the deadly stuff that we have to uh, make sure is not occurring with the patient. Let's say uh, everything initially comes back looking good for your patient, the whole workup, and they still have chest pain. Well, depending on the patient presentation, again, the vital signs, medical history, and risk factors, the patient, again, may end up receiving serial EKGs and troponins, meaning by this, we mean that they're going to get repeated again at a specific time in the future, right? So usually they're going to repeat them two or three more times from the initial one at intervals of like four, six, or eight hours. So the first one was at one o'clock, the next one might be at six o'clock from them, and then another one at six o'clock for that, from that second one. And that's what we mean by serial troponins. And why do they do that? Because as we said, troponins rise from two to six hours, right? So let's say the patient is having uh, some type of damage to the heart. The EKG wasn't all that great, really couldn't tell much. But in the first troponin is negative. Well, what if the second troponin comes back positive? And that's why they do uh, the serial ones. And I've had that plenty of times. The first EKG looks kind of wonky, but not fully in MI. The first troponin is not is not uh, positive for anything. But the second one comes back elevated. So that escalates the situation. Cardiology gets involved, and they figure out uh, what's going to go, what's going to happen with the patient, right? And then ultimately, the patient will receive a formal echocardiogram and even a stress test.
Now, here, I just wanted to show the progression of MMI as shown through an EKG, right? With this image, um, you're going to note that a lot of providers and a lot of nurses will focus on ST elevation as shown up here on the top right. And it has to be precisely an ST elevation of two of those little squares uh, in consecutive leads, right? So when you see this, that tombstone, so then by tombstone, you're going to see the ST elevation at the clear MI, um, but it has to be in consecutive leads. So what do we mean by consecutive leads? So by consecutive leads, we mean that the leads correspond to a specific part of the heart. So this is what an EKG uh, looks like. So here's the EKG. It leads one, two, three, and so forth, but then you go back and it's the same thing. Each little section right here is corresponding to an EKG, right? So lead one, two, three, AVR, AVL, and so forth. The same thing is here, eight, one, two, three, AVR, AVL, right? But here, this shows you what corresponds to each part of the heart. So two, three, and AVF, or to the inferior part of the heart, V1, V2, or the septal part of the heart, and then V3, V4, or the anterior part of the heart, V5, V6, one, AVL belong to the lateral part of the heart. So then let's go on to the next line, kind of just to review it, right? So this is the same thing as this, but this kind of just breaks down which part of the EKG goes where, right? So again, 2, 3, and AVF are inferior. V1, V2 is septal. V3, V4 is anterior. And then V5, V6, 1, and AVL are lateral. Here, I just wanted to show which arteries supply which parts of the heart that we are discussing. So the green oval here is the lateral portion of the heart. And then we uh, talked over which parts of the EKG go, to, go with that. The blue is the anterior. The orange is the septal. And then the yellow is the inferior part, right? So here it kind of shows which part of the heart is being affected and then which uh, arteries are being affected causing that ischemia going to that heart muscle. And then again, let's just go back and review. Inferior, inferior, inferior. So two, three, AVF or inferior, inferior. V1, V2 is septal. V3, V4 is anterior. V5, V6, one, and AVL or lateral. And then it's shown here, right? So based on what we've briefly reviewed today, where do we see SC elevation, right? So looking, looking, we clearly see some here, some here, and some here, right? Uh, these are pretty much elevated. So what what, uh, what part of the EKG, what part of the heart is this looking at? So it's looking at, again, give me a second. So this is going to be an inferior MI, right? So 2, 3, and AVF for inferior MI. Go on to the next one. So where do we see SC elevation here? None there, none there. So we see some in V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. So here we have an anterior lateral MI, right? Because we have some here, and then we have a little bit over here as well. So we have an anterior lateral MI. Let's go into some nursing specific things. It starts before even the patient arrives. You must be, you must have your rooms ready for business before anybody shows up. So you're going to have suction ready. You're going to have ambu, bug, ambu bags, and that's the bag valve mask where you do the 3C technique to uh, uh, give oxygen to someone and to ventilate them. So that's what I mean by ambu bags. You're going to have that ready. You're going to have all your supplies ready in the room. So when the patient arrives, again, most important thing, right, is going to be getting that EKG done as soon as possible, getting an IV, sending the labs, placing the patient in the cardiac monitor, placing the patient on oxygen if needed. And, and something that a lot of people forget is placing pads on the patients who come in sicker for anything cardiac related. Because anything can happen at any time. Your patient can come in seeming stable, but they can their heart, they can go into a full uh, cardiac arrest at any moment. So you have to have uh, the necessary supplies ready and even pads on if your patient is that sick, right? Uh, at some facilities, uh, you're going to have to notify x-ray for them to come shoot a portable chest x-ray. And if that, if that is your facility, just make sure, make sure that you're coordinating with that. And the same, the same thing goes with CT. Are you, do you have to be the one coordinating with them or do they kind of just know, hey, like we're going to go uh, pick your patient up? Either way, if your patient's sick, you have to be going to CT with them to make sure that nothing happens and to monitor them and to react. We'll be proactive and then you're going to react if something does happen, right? So... All right, so we'll finish there. Again, that was the chest pain workup, knowing what's included, like the labs, the ECG, and even radiology, like ultrasound and CT scans. And of course, like always, uh, teamwork makes a dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.